to Get Real with Estiel, a woman empowerment podcast hosted by Estiel Albaba. Hello and welcome to another episode of Get Real with Estiel. Today is Monday, March 12th, 2018. Uh, Well, it's March break here in Canada, so if you're on March break or your kids are on March break, I hope you enjoy uh, a great week ahead. It could also be a hectic week for parents who uh, aren't necessarily traveling anywhere with their kids, but just have no idea what to do with their kids at this point. Uh, Regardless, I have prepared uh, an episode filled with success principles because I'm going back to that book by Jack Canfield. So if this is your first time listening in to my podcast, I love to share things that I find are practical tools to empower you uh, to make the most out of your life, but also keeping it real and and translating these concepts and theories into practical day-to-day things while embracing our authenticity, because that's important. So I started um, pretty much summarizing the book, Success Principles by Jack Canfield, which has 62 principles that ultimately get you from where you are to where you want to be. And so far, I've uh, talked about 38 out of these 62 principles. So today I'll be talking about principle number 39, 40, and 41, since they're short, so we can cover them all in one episode. Uh, and I hope you enjoy them. But before I get into them, I actually am reading another book by Renee Brown, which I will totally be discussing in future episodes because it's so rich in content that's valuable and tools that are so much needed in today's society to enhance our communication, to enhance our relationships, and really just make our world a better place. So it's certainly concepts that I want to visit in future episodes to talk about vulnerability and shame and just overall uh being authentic and real like her talks are so up my alley it's just amazing amazing content from her books Um, so one of the paragraphs i came across this morning that i thought i'll share with you before i get into the success principles was this paragraph in a children's classic it was called the velveteen rabbit and it's by marguerite williams and in this specific uh paragraph that renee uh sorry brene shared in her book is really about the definition of being wholehearted and real so here's how this a paragraph goes and obviously i'm sharing it because this podcast is really just about being real about taking off the mask and just showing who you are and truly who you are to the world so it goes like that real isn't how you are made said the skin horse it's things that happen to you When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with you, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? Asks the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up? He asked, or bit by bit. Well, it happens all at once said the skin horse. You become, it takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often help, uh, sorry, it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or have sharp edges or have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been lopped off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joint and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, You can't be ugly except to people who do not understand. So I just thought that this is something I wanted to share, uh, given the profound message uh, it has. And it it is in a children's book, which is really, really interesting, that these concepts are being taught to our kids early on, as they should be. Um, And I'll get into it in future episodes where we can delve deeper into this concept of vulnerability and shame and the importance of embracing both. Uh, as part of our human nature because ultimately when you're vulnerable authentic and real that's when you're making the most out of your life and just enjoying it in every way you possibly can so just wanted to have that side note to start off this episode and now i am totally ready to get into these success principles time to get serious 
All right, so principle number 39, that's where we're at. So just to remind you, if you want to listen to success principles um, up until that point, they're scattered into previous episodes as I do not do it um, consecutively. So number 39 talks about staying focused on your core genius. That's what this principle is about. And it starts by a quote by Malcolm Forbes, who obviously uh, published the Forbes magazine. And it says, success follows doing what you want to do. There's no other way to be successful. Uh, So obviously, Forbes magazine always features success people. So it's really great to see what somebody who surrounds himself by successful people deduces about what it takes to get to that stage. And it if it boils down to something as simple as doing what you love to do, um, then then I don't know why people don't necessarily embrace that and incorporate it in their lives. And it's really interesting because it does sound simple, but it certainly isn't easy. Because sometimes we we lack the knowledge of what it is that we like to do, and sometimes we lack the tools to help us to find ways to then do it or or do more of it per se. So the core genius that this chapter is referring to is simply the things that are, that make you unique, the core talents that only you are able to offer this world. So as an example, if you are like uh, a numbers person and you're just a really great accountant, then you need to be folk and you enjoy it. Let's say you enjoy it. Uh, really hard to believe, but let's say there's someone out there who really just enjoys numbers and accounting. Uh, so if that's if that person was to be focused on the things they like to do in the specific job, they're able then to delegate the other tasks, such as, let's say, administrative tasks or whatever else is needed to be taken care of in an accounting firm, is then delegated to other people and other staff. Because successful people believe that they need to uh, be in charge of the tasks that make them unique while freeing up their time and delegating the other tasks to their team. So most people though are afraid of looking uh, wasteful and, and they're, they're really afraid of being judged as being above everyone else. So because of that, they're afraid to give up the control and reluctant to spend money on this help. So if you're an accountant who really feels that you can use administrative help or hire a secretary or assistant or an associate, whatever terminology fits your industry, then deep down inside, you simply don't want to let go of these tasks, not because you like doing them, but because the perception around what it looks like when you hire that extra person to help you. like. Sometimes society prevents us from advancing ourselves that way simply because of all this inner voices in our heads and how we perceive certain things. So for example, we we start looking like, oh, I'm going to now look like some big shot. Or And while some people enjoy that, some people enjoy that extra perception and maybe even go out of their way to seek it even if they don't need it. So there is that category altogether but here we're, we're exploring another concept where it's actually really needed and then um, instrumental and in even bigger success so just reflect on your work and reflect on are you really dedicating your full attention and your full um, passion is being embraced by the tasks that you enjoy doing and sometimes Like, for example, in my case, I am employed, so I'm not really an entrepreneur just yet, maybe in the future. But while I'm being employed, obviously, I have to respect the job descriptions I've signed on. So there's obviously always going to be tasks that are not my absolute favorite to do. And maybe delegating in this case is not an option. However, I still try to make the most out of my time by focusing on the 80-20 rule, knowing that 80% of your result is usually derived by 20% of your tasks. So focusing then on what these 20% tasks are and, and, and delegating even more time to them helps increase your productivity and your result overall. And then the tasks that you don't so much enjoy doing because 
you still have the obligation to do them and you don't have the option to delegate it, uh, you can then find ways to um, just make it more enjoyable. So for example, let's say you filing, let's say filing uh, is part of your tasks. What you can do is delegate, dedicate a specific day to file. Let's say the first day of every month or you know, an afternoon on a Friday or something like that and reward yourself after. So the filing itself is always going to be a nuisance, but you can tell yourself, okay, this day I'm dedicating it for filing. And as a result of that, I'm going to treat myself to like a two hour lunch break or going after work uh, to a spa or just going to grab, uh, grab my favorite drink in my favorite spot after or whatever the case may be. This way you add a twist on a task that you don't necessarily enjoy in itself uh, but you just now make an experience out of it that ultimately makes this task uh, just easier to deal with it's not going away but it's easier to deal with so reflect on the type of work you have are you somebody who's capable of hiring people to delegate tasks for or are you employed and you just have to find ways to make whatever unenjoyable tasks doable uh, or what is your current work situation? Just reflect on that and see what you can do to focus and bring out your core genius. Because uh, one of the things that was mentioned in this chapter is that uh, focusing on your core genius almost makes you like a con artist doing what you love to do. So what that means is you're simply an entrepreneur that con people, uh, it's definitely not the way I would personally illustrate it, but this is just how it's illustrated here. So you're absolutely making people pay you to do what you love to do and get better at it. So for example, Tiger Woods loves to play, play golf. It's just something he absolutely enjoys. So he gets people to pay him big money to play golf, essentially. And that makes him a con artist uh, as an, an entrepreneur who simply gets money to enjoy what he likes to do. Uh, Tony Robbins is another person. He's a speaker and a trainer. He loves speaking. He really definitely is one of my role models. And he arranged his life in such a way where people are constantly paying him large sums of money to do what he likes to do. So these are really good examples and people in different industries just making their living, enjoying their careers simultaneously. And it does sound... Uh, that the majority of our society, unfortunately, does not fit into that category. And I would love for it to, to move towards a direction uh, as a society in general, where we can go to work motivated and inspired and fulfilled. Because when you're fulfilled by the work you do, you're bringing that fulfillment home and then you're enriching your relationships, whether it's your romantic partners or relationships with your kids or even friends or society in general. So ultimately, the ripple effects and the magnitude of how you can absolutely feel as a human being just because of the work you do is humongous. So this is not an area where we can take lightly or just neglect. It's absolutely an area where we need to nourish and and just take an absolute serious look at it to enhance how we deal with it and, and the impact it has on our lives. So I am so passionate about that because even uh, as a financial planner, I work a lot with retirees or with people approaching retirement. So I get to see what people think about at that life stage of the transitions they're going through and reflecting on the career path they embarked on. And it's really easy to see for me and to spot uh, the difference between somebody who really, really enjoyed what they did and somebody who did not. And the difference in the quality of lives they're absolutely leading, their health, their relationships. Like it's really easy for me to spot given the conversations I have. So it's certainly an area in life where I'm very passionate about talking about and, and and encouraging people to absolutely step back, reflect on how they work, what they do, and if it's truly in alignment with their calling. So when you do what you love to do, money will follow. And there's another quote here that I can offer you by Greer Garson who said, Starting out to make money is the greatest mistake in life. Do what you feel you have a flair for doing, and if you are good enough at it, 
money will come. So that was just a perspective. The interesting thing about this specific point is that there's theories or opinions out there that say exactly the opposite of it. So to be a devil's advocate, um, this specific chapter illustrated in such a way where you need to absolutely focus on the things you enjoy doing and and somehow life will bring opportunities to help you monetize on these things you enjoy doing. And that's just one school of thought uh, that's offered in the specific book. Another school of thought is saying that that's the wrong approach to life. You need to actually find ways to make money. And then when you make money, you become uh, free enough to have more time to your hobbies. In other words, what you decide to pursue in order to make money does not have to be your passion. But because you pursued something that enabled you to become financially independent, then you have the resources, which are in this case, financial resources, to enjoy your hobbies and enjoy your life and increase the quality of your life anyway. So there's this other school of thought that contradicts this one. Uh, people who believe that say that following your dream and following your passion is your biggest BS because it, your passions and your dreams may not necessarily be uh, needed in society in such a way that derives financial income out of them. So you still need to find ways to make money and that enables you at the end of the day to follow your passions uh, in, in different ways or different reasons outside the uh, reason for making money. So what's my take on that? Well, I then sit and reflect on that because two schools of thought both offer appealing arguments and appealing logic behind them. My thought is this. I shared an, I shared this in another episode and I said, when you find an intersection between what your passions are, what's needed in the world, and what you're good at, and when these three things intersect, if there's a job that you can derive from there, then you can absolutely uh follow that specific intersection. But if you really are passionate about something immensely, but there's no market demand for it, then the the other school of thought may prove to be right, where you're not necessarily following your passion to become financial and independent, but the other way around. So I think the um, what I would personally adopt or what I would personally believe in is that it all depends on what your passion is. And that's how you then determine if it's through your passion that you're going to be a financial dip independent or is it through your financial independency that you're going to be pursuing your passion. It's going to be different answers for different people. Uh, in my case, as an example, I have a career that I am absolutely passionate about. And I, it is the intersection between my passions and my uh, ultimately skills and talents and it's also needed in the world so there is that sweet spot intersection between all three circles and that's why I can excel in the career I have uh, well at least strive to obviously it's constant learning and I constantly try to improve uh, and, and it's always going to be a journey but it took me a long time to get to the spot because it's a series of reflections and introspections and also testing and learning. There's jobs I've had in the past that I absolutely hated, where I did not fit, where my skills were underutilized, where I felt underemployed. And all these things existed, which is why every time you get an opportunity, if you reflect on it, then you're able to understand exactly what your next steps should be to make it better. So I, I'm a big believer in that. So in other words, just to take a step back and reflect on what we talked about here, while this chapter encourages you to follow your passions and focus on your core genius, I strongly think that you need to reflect on more than just that element in society. You need to reflect on the market you're in, the economical situations we're in, uh, and different elements all together to then ultimately bring the best version out of you to the world. And I do remember listening to this TED talk about this person who, I don't remember the job exactly, but I knew it had something to do with, you know, garbage and recycling and just like a filthy work atmosphere. I do not recall exactly what it, what that job entailed, but you can only imagine how unbearable and 
just um, you know unwanted this job is. That person, however, found niche ways to deliver a service that's absolutely required in society because we all need garbage maintenance somehow. And because of how little people, how little the number of people who want that job. Uh, it, it really pays very well. So that person used that niche to then become extremely financially dependent. He became very successful, made millions of dollars doing a job that very few people ever want to do, and ultimately used the, these millions to pursue a lifestyle that he then enjoys. So he had, uh, like I said earlier, the opposite advice of this chapter by saying, you should not follow your passions. You should just follow what is in demand and that's what makes you money to then follow your passions uh, and that's just another school of thought that i wanted to share with you here to play the devil's advocate but also to tell you that there is no size that fits all in society we're too complex as human beings for one formula to work for all of us and that's part of what being real and authentic is and that's why i started the specific episode by reminding you that the most important thing out of everything I share is reminding you about how important it is to reflect on that lesson and apply it in your life in ways that make sense for you. Sometimes it may be a success principle that works for every single person around you, but it will not work for you. And you need to be mindful of that. It doesn't make you somebody who's wrong. It just makes you somebody who's self-aware and, and knows what works for you and what not. Uh, an example I can give on that is, for example, waking up early. You read it everywhere. Everywhere you uh, read interviews with successful people or top qualities for a successful life or whatever the case is, you would see that waking up early and being a morning person is certainly on the list. It's repeatedly said and, and it's worded differently in different contexts, but ultimately is perceived to be an important quality for a successful life. However, there are people who are night owls and can never wake up early, can never embrace the morning, can never feel productive at that time of the day they feel more productive maybe at at midnight or like two in the morning versus waking up at five they'd rather go to bed at five i know people like that it's not it's not often that you come across people like that but but it, it exists so if a person like that is reading success principles and thinking they have to mold into that into that person just because that's what works for the people that are featured in a specific article let's say it, that doesn't make sense. So it could be that the majority of people fit in that category of being a morning person or, or uh, embracing the morning routine. That specific person should be self-aware and realize that, you know what, it's not for me. While I can see it working for other people, I know what works for me best. So I encourage you that whatever I share with you here, have that reflection and see if it's something that works for you you can mold it you can customize it you can make it fit somehow but extract the new the, the nucleus concepts are going to be fundamental and universal because it's really just about redefining and finding hacks to improve your brain and your life ultimately uh, but ultimately how you do that is customized so while the nucleus of the principles are universal the way that, that you then practice them is customized per you and that's part of being authentic so i actually had the intentions originally to dive into two other principles because i thought like literally this principle is no more than three pages i thought i'll be able to cover it very quickly but i did dive into uh, other areas uh, simult like uh, not what was I gonna say spontaneously that's the word uh, spontaneously I just came up with other ideas that I shared as I went through this episode which uh, brings us almost to 25 minutes here so I think that's good enough to start and k help us kick off the week so uh, I just wanted to leave you with these thoughts that I shared with you in today's episode I hope you can reflect on them um, see what works for you and I would love to hear from you. I love always to hear stories from my listeners and just understand 
how they perceive a specific um, episode and how it pans out in their life so that we can learn from each other. So pray, please reach out to me, whether you agree, disagree, what your thoughts are. Uh, do, are you currently following your passions? Are you currently not? Uh, what's, you know, what's questions you would like me to explore in future episodes? Uh, I would absolutely love to hear all that. So I look forward to future episodes where we can learn grow and most importantly get real together take care everybody